praise the Lord. I'm so glad that you're able to be here for this Bible study. We're, we're starting a brand new study. We finished up Ecclesiastes last week, and now we're going to start our Bible study in the book of Job, and we'll see how the Lord leads us. It's going to be a discovery for me. I have I've read through the book of Job many times. I've never done an in-depth study, and that's part of the challenge. Part of the, the enjoyment of doing these Bible studies is that we get to do an in-depth study. So we're going to start that tonight. Uh, let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to be with us in this Bible study. Dear Father, Lord, this is your word Lord, this is your service. Lord, we are your people, the sheep of your pasture. Lord, I pray that you would guide and that you would help us in this Bible study. Give us direction and unction and anointing and help, O oh Lord. Lord, we're believing you and trusting you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing a couple of choruses here. He's a good God, a good God to us. He is a good God, and I know that He loves me. He healed my body and delivered me. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, He's the same. I will praise His name. He is a good God, and I know that He loves me my body and delivered me yesterday today and tomorrow he's the same i will praise his name one more time he is a good god and i know that he loves me he healed my body and delivered me yesterday today and tomorrow he's the same i will Isn't he good? Oh, he's been good. God has been so very good to me. And I love him. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my prayers. Because he inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. Yeah. Love the Lord. He's sure been good to me. Praise the Lord. Like I said, we're going to start our Bible study in Job and begin studying through that tonight. I would like to offer you an overview, an introduction, and an overview. In uh, if you're seeing this on YouTube. Uh, in the uh, right underneath this uh, or somewhere on that page anyway in the explanation part of the video 
I've put a link there so that you can download uh, my study notes here. And so you're welcome to welcome to get those if you would like to. Uh, like I said, this is we, we'll be getting into hopefully the book of Job next week. And right now this is the introduction and the overview. I think it's kind of good to see a big picture sometimes uh, before we get into the finer points of it. Let's pray again and ask the Lord to be with us in this Bible study. Dear God, Lord, this is your word. Lord, and you're the only one, really, Lord, that knows exactly what it's supposed to say because you wrote it. Lord, give us Help by the Holy Spirit to see and understand your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to give you an outline for this. Uh, the book of Job, and I was wondering exactly how to do this and not being able to show it to you on a screen uh, but so that you could see it, like I said, if you download this outline and look at it, it'll probably make it a whole lot clearer to you as you're looking at it. The first chapter of the book of Job gives us the crisis in heaven. Um, it starts out in verses 1 through 5. It gives us a description of who Job was. And Job was a great guy. Just let me read it. And we're, like I said, we're not going to go over it. We'll actually start here in chapter one next week. But listen to this description of Job. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. I'm reading from the old King James. That word eschewed means to turn away from evil. And he did. He, uh, apparently he shunned evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, and 3,000 camels, and 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, everyone his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. What a great guy. I'm, I mean, a, a fantastic, godly, upright man. And that's... Part of the key, I know many of you already know the story of Job, and I don't want to bore you with that, but things went south in a hurry for Job. So the first five verses that I read to you tell us who we're talking about, Job, an upright, God-fearing man. Starting at verse 6 to the end of the chapter of chapter 1, there's a scene in heaven. Well, not to the end of the chapter, I'm sorry, to a verse from a chapter, or verse 6 to um, verse 12. And it gives us a conversation in heaven that Job is never privy to. Job never, and that's another important thing, to remember that Job never knows, hears, is completely unaware of this conversation in heaven. And then uh, verses, um, verse 13 to the end of the chapter, verse 22, 
Everything that Job owned is taken away from him. Uh, even all of his children die. Uh, to me, it's unbelievably tragic. Chapter 2 begins again with that scene in heaven. And uh, again, Job never sees the drama in heaven. Doesn't see any of it. And uh, then because of that scene in heaven, then Satan afflicts Job with uh, a bodily disease that's incredibly painful. So in just a very short amount of time, Job, who was very rich, loses everything. And then a very short time after that is afflicted with an incredibly painful, loathsome disease. After we go through all of that in chapter 2, verse 11, Job gets a visit from three friends. And we'll talk about that later as we get into it. Chapter 3 begins a series of dialogues between Job and his friends. It's a search. Uh, the outline that I'm using is from the Life in the Spirit Study Bible. Uh, so, I mean, this is not, this outline is not my material at all. Uh, it's chapter three begins a search for intellectual answers, and it continues all the way to chapter 31 and verse 40. Let me give you just a quick description of, of these dialogues. They go in three cycles. And the way that these cycles work, chapter three, Job gives a lament for everything that's happened. Chapters 4 and 5, one of his friends named Eliphaz replies. And then Job gives a rejoinder in, cha in uh, chapters 6 and 7. And then the second friend, Bildad, gives a reply in chapter 8. Job again gives an answer to Bildad in chapters 9 and 10. Zophar, the third friend, gives a reply in chapter 11. And then Job answers Zophar's reply in chapters 12, 13, and 14. Then it starts that cycle back all over again. Eliphaz gives a response in chapter 15. Job answers Eliphaz in chapters 16 and 17. Bildad gives his speech, chapter 18. Job answers Bildad's speech in chapter 19. And then Zophar, the third friend, gives his speech in chapter 20. And then Job, uh, in chapter 21, gives his answer to them. And then we start the third cycle of this dialogue. Now, the third cycle differs from the first two in that the last one, Zophar, doesn't have any speech. Whenever we finish Zophar's speech in the second dialogue, Zophar never says anything. So we begin the third dialogue in chapter 22. Eliphaz gives an answer. And Job gives a rejoinder in chapters 23 and 24. Bildad, the second friend, responds. Did you know that Bildad was the shortest guy ever, ever, ever? Whenever we get into it, we'll see that his name was Bildad the Shoe Height. Only the height of a shoe. Ha, 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 ha. And then Job gives his answer in chapter 26. And then Job, in a very long speech, uh, chapters 27, 28, 29, 30, and 31, gives his final summary. 
Then another character, a, a guy by the name of Elihu, steps in. And Elihu describes himself as a young man. And Elihu has this huge, long speech that he gives. It's chapter 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, and 37. And in this, Elihu gives four speeches. Okay? So, and we won't, I won't go through, but anyway, it's a lot of chapters and Elihu gives his, gives all of his, his four speeches there. And then amazingly, God answers Job. I mean, God in a very literal voice that everybody could hear answers Job. And it's chapters 38, 39, 40, 41, and then the first part of chapter 42. And then Job, I mean, just as soon as God speaks in the first six verses of chapter 42, Job says, what can I say? I'm left without anything to say. I mean, what can you say to God? And then from that point on, we begin the epilogue. And God tells Job to do some things. And Job prays for his friend. And then the last part of chapter 42, verses 10 through 17, tells us how God restored Job and blessed him with everything in, in abundance over everything that he had lost. The book of Job. And Job suffered through all of this. Part of the suffering of Job, we talked about the dialogues of these three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And these three friends tried to make Job feel guilty for being afflicted. Now, the theme of Job is understanding how God interacts with his world. Namely, this way, that God can give free choice to a person. He can allow that person to have every rational reason to doubt God and God can still have that person to be faithful. That's what the whole book of Job, that's what it shows us. And through all of Job's heartache, disappointment, and pain, God did nothing to persuade or convince Job to put his faith in him. And yet, Job remained faithful to God. We're going to look at why over all of this. But the theme of, of Job is understanding how God interacts with us. It's hard to understand why God doesn't come on the scene sometimes and fix everything. I would love to not have to have gone through this COVID-19 disease. But look what God's done. I would never would be having a Bible study with the camera if it hadn't have been that way. But God knows how to use everything. And if we'll just be obedient and be faithful, that was the deal with Job. In spite of everything that should have led him to the contrary, even Job's wife, his own wife said, Why are you continuing the charade? Curse God and die. And Job said, You, you speak like a foolish woman. Can't we receive good and bad from God. I'm telling you, we've got a wonderful, wonderful study ahead of us. Through all of this, God did not reach out and try to prove himself to Job. 
Never once. And Job still never turned his back on God. So let's just kind of look at this overview here. In the book of Job, and in the expression of these characters that I talked to you about of this story, nobody, including Job, is entirely right, and no one has it all wrong. Most of the time, and for years, I looked at, at uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and Elihu, and I thought, oh, man, Job was the righteous one, and these guys had no... I mean, they were criticizing Job and accusing Job and... and tearing him up, telling Job that he was the one that was at fault, that he brought all of this on himself. And Job had done absolutely nothing to bring this on himself. Nothing. But we're not far. Be honest with me. We're not far from Eliphaz, Bildad, and so far. Because when we don't understand God, when we don't understand why a friend of ours is having to suffer like he or she does, we want to give all kinds of spiritual platitudes and reasons. We're going to get into this. I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this, to this Bible study. In this story about Job, no one was entirely right, but no one was entirely wrong either. Everybody struggled with their own ideas and, and not errors, but misconceptions about who God was. Everyone tries to explain away the horror of Job's condition according to to each one's point of view. I was raised up in Pentecost. I was raised up in church. I have heard people explain to others how they are so wrong that God does not approve of that. And uh, if they don't change their ways, then God's going to punish them and bring judgment and condemnation upon them. In one sense, perhaps all of that may have an element of truth in that. But oftentimes we forget that God is a good God. And He loves people. God loves you. God wants more than anything else for you to succeed and have a wonderful life. God doesn't want bad things to happen to you. God wants good things to happen to you. So... We're going to look at this. Let's look at all of these characters. Let's look at their point of view, where they're coming from. Job, the one who's suffering. To him, there is no logic to his suffering, and there's no end of it in view. As far as Job knows, he is going to get worse and worse and die. That's what it looks like. He lived, this looks like the end of Job's life. He has contracted some disease and he's not going to survive it. And it's a bad disease. And so, I mean, Job has lived an upright life. Job has spent his life trying to please God. Now he's suffering unspeakably. He's trying to make sense of what is an obvious act of God. I mean, for everything to happen as it happened. I mean, in moments, Job lost everything, even all ten of his children. I cannot imagine the grief that Job and his wife felt 
and had. I, I just... I can't imagine it. And through the book of Job, we'll get glimpses of the grief that Job went through in the loss of his children. But it, I mean, this couldn't have happened by an accident. This was obviously to Job an act of God. But Job never sees all of the things that happened in heaven. All of these uh, things that that uh, the Bible talks about, just kind of a, a for instance, I'm starting here in verse 6 of chapter 1. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. The Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And uh, Satan says, from going to and fro in the earth, walking up and down in it. And God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? I'm changing these uh, these and thous and some of the wording here, but I'm, I'm giving you the sense of it. And even God is proud of Job. He said, there's none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man. He fears God and eschews evil. Satan said, and here in my, and I'm going to talk about it here in just a second. Here is the key idea in the book of Job. I mean, this is everything right here. Satan says, doth Job fear God for naught or for nothing? He said, you've made, you've, you've got a hedge around him. You take care of him. You've enriched him. You've blessed everything that he does. He's lived for you, yes, but then you give him all, all of the good stuff and you won't let me touch him. And God says, all right, I'll let you touch what he has. And Satan takes it all away in a second. Just minutes, not a second, but just minutes. Chapter 2, Job never... I mean, there, the last, in verse 22 of chapter 1, in all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Chapter 2 begins back in heaven. Again, these are the things that Job never sees. Job does not know there is a test going on in heaven. And uh, God says to Satan in chapter 2, Look, he hasn't cursed me. He hasn't denied me. And Satan says, Yeah, but you didn't let me touch his body. He said, Let me make him suffer. Let me make him hurt. And you'll see him curse you to your face. And God says, Okay, you can touch his body, but you can't take his life. I think it's significant that Satan is limited in what he can do to us. So the test for Job, all of this drama in heaven is completely hidden from Job. And the test for Job is to keep his faith and remain faithful even though his emotions, his health, and the facts argue against it. How could there be a God that would allow these things to happen? I'm telling you, this is the crux of this story. And we're going to explore all of who God is and how God deals with his world. Job's wife, she's the one that said um, in chapter 2, uh, verse 9, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. It's easy for us to pass judgments against Job's wife. But I'm telling you, if any of us had suffered the loss of one's children, all ten children, like she had. She lost all of her security. She lost her whole way of living. All of their riches were gone. Everything they owned was gone. And they were penniless, broke, destitute, and broken down in just minutes. I don't know. I don't know if any of us 
could manage our spirits any better than what she did. Come on, be honest with me. To Job's wife, God failed. So the three friends come and try to comfort. I'll air quote that. And I probably will air quote the comfort all through this Bible study. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Eliphaz tries to rationalize the injustice of Job's sufferings. And uh, he tries to, I mean, just like we do when we have friends that suffer, our first response most of the time is to try to justify God and blame somebody. And that's what all three of these friends did. Uh, Eliphaz tries to do it rationally. Bildad Again, felt it was important to justify God. Yes, the sufferings are unfair, but Job must have done something to deserve them. And as Eliphaz goes into his arguments, my, he accuses Job of so many things. So far assumed that somehow all of this had to be Job's fault. And so Eliphaz acted as Job's prosecutor. As we, as we read, as we will read the two chapters of Zophar uh, separated in the first two dialogues, uh, Zophar puts himself up as the prosecuting attorney. And he tries to prove how Job is at fault. After the three dialogues, after the three discourses, Elihu, Elihu in his youthful arrogance, he tries to understand Job's dilemma by feeling after his own relationship with God and by comparing Job's situation with his own spiritual insight. Elihu was a young man, a good young man, a wise young man that loved God and apparently studied the scriptures diligently. He sought after God, whereas Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar tried to blame Job based on God's justice. Elihu feels this spiritual need, this, this longing in his heart for God, and basically through all of those chapters, and we'll go through them, says if Job would have just sought after God, if he would have just longed after God, God would have never treated him this way. And God's up in heaven looking down. Eliphaz, most of what Eliphaz says is good. Most of what Bildad says is exactly right. Most of what Zophar says is spot on. But they make a bad application. Uh, Elihu, what a godly young man. And his reasoning is heart-touching and precious, but... Job's not the one to blame here. And all of them feel that he is. These are the characters. But I also want to present God and Satan as very important characters in this. Satan is the disruptor, the accuser, the opportunist. And Satan's nature hasn't changed to this day. He is the disruptor, the accuser, the opportunist that takes advantage of every situation and circumstance he possibly can. But God. Job never realizes this about God until all the way at the end. But God is just, righteous, compassionate, 
willing to do what is good and best. And God will do these things even though he may never be understood or appreciated. I have a hard time watching anyone suffer, especially if I'm the one that had to cause that. But God is of such a character that if it will work, as it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, if it will work together for our good, God's going to do it that way, even though we don't see it at the time. So here, I'm, I'm fixing to close, fixing to quit here. And then next week, we'll start chapter 1 of Job. Some conclusions that I would like to draw with you. God is able to have reasons that we don't understand. Obviously. But that does not mean that God is unfair or unjust. God can have reasons that we don't understand and still be fair and just. God can do things that don't make sense to us and still be good and loving. It may look like God is exactly the opposite of that. But we have to put our faith in God that He is good and loving. So for us, here's another conclusion, for us, no matter how much we may try to explain and to understand, we cannot grasp the entirety of the situation and therefore we cannot fully comprehend and it doesn't make any difference whether we're on the side of suffering or we're on the side of the one observing the suffering. We may be doing the suffering or we may be watching and ministering to someone who is suffering. But not one of us can grasp the entirety of what God is doing. Listen, we have to leave things with God. We just have to turn it over to Him. The pivotal and defining key verse in the book of Job is chapter 1 and verse 9. I read it to you just a moment ago. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? I want to drive this home to you, I hope. This question was not merely rhetorical. If it's a rhetorical question, it already assumes either uh, an affirmative answer or a negative answer, but the answer is already assumed. This is not a rhetorical question, and this question demands an answer. Listen to it again. Doth Job fear God for naught? This question also begs the application. What about you? Do you fear God for nothing? Do you fear God as long as everything's good and uh, things are going the way that they ought to go and you're prospering? What about when things aren't going as good? Do you fear God for nothing? So what this asks, and what it asks us, what is the logical limit of your faith in God? What will it take? How far will it go before you give up and not put your faith in God? What is the logical limit of your faith? Job shows us what true faith is. Real faith remains even when logic seems to be against it. Real faith remains regardless of how much life may hurt. That's hard.
Real faith remains even when there is no feeling of assurance or validation. Some would say, well, if you have that kind of faith, how can you go wrong? It's always, it's just a blind faith and you just have to suspend your disbelief and just believe regardless of the facts against it. Well, that's not true. We're not putting our faith in the circumstances. We're putting our faith in God. Science sometimes, oftentimes, disputes faith in God and says that that faith in God is not a valid thing, that, that faith in God is not supported by the facts. Well, faith will never be validated by science, ever. And neither will science ever be reconciled to faith because the two are in entirely different spheres. Faith isn't trying to prove anything. And science can't make faith something that it's not. It's, it's knowing that there's a God and choosing to believe in Him. But here's what I believe, and this is my last statement. A person can acknowledge both faith and science without dismissing either one. A person can put their trust in God and believe in the God of the Bible. And he can also believe in empirical studies, empirical evidence to, to see things being proven and see those, uh, see the laws of, of nature discovered. That can happen and they both can exist together in perfect harmony. Our whole study is going to be about putting our faith in God, even though we don't understand. Hope to see you next week. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the beginning of this study. Thank you for this marvelous book of the Bible. Lord, guide our hearts, our minds. Help us, oh God, to be able, Lord, to put our faith and confidence in you. We'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you richly. Hope to see you again next week.